In this video, I'm going to cover radioactive decay. So let's uh, look a little bit more closely at alpha decay. So we've seen that an alpha particle is uh, composed of two protons, right? Two protons and two neutrons. And if we look at the periodic table, we see that the element that has two protons is helium, and the most stable isotope of helium also has two neutrons. Two protons, two neutrons. So this is just a helium nucleus. So an alpha particle is just the nucleus of a helium atom without its two electrons. So remember, a helium atom is neutral because it has two electrons that are orbiting the two protons, and plus two minus two cancels out to equal zero. But when I'm talking about an alpha particle, it's just the nucleus. It's just the two protons plus two, and there are no electrons. So an alpha particle is uh, a helium nucleus without the orbiting electrons. So alpha decay occurs when an unstable nucleus emits a particle composed of two protons and two neutrons. Um, and remember, we looked at how far alpha particles can penetrate into matter. And um, generally, alpha particles um, are not very, they can't penetrate into matter very far. So alpha particles get absorbed by pretty much the first piece of matter they interact with. Um, but they are the most ionizing, which means they have the highest tendency when they do interact with matter, they have the highest tendency to turn that neutral matter into an ion by either ejecting electrons from that atom or ejecting protons from the nucleus. So uh, loss of an alpha particle, it means that the atomic number decreases by two, because there's two protons, and it means that the mass number decreases by four because each of these weighs one. One, two, three, four. So when uranium-238, the, there's 92 protons in uranium. When uranium-238 undergoes alpha decay, it turns into element number 90. Because it, losing alpha decay means that it loses two protons, so 92 minus two is 90, and it loses four mass particles, so 238 minus four is 234. So uranium turns into thorium, and if we knew that uranium was losing this alpha particle, we could cover this up right here, and I would still know that uranium, if it loses an alpha particle, is gonna generate something that's 23490, and how do I know what that something is? I look up the element number 90 on the periodic table. It's thorium. So here's what that looks like. An unstable nucleus, which is unstable because it has the wrong ratio of protons to neutrons. Stable nuclei have uh, a different ratio of protons to neutrons. And since it's unstable, it wants to become stable, and it does that by emitting some particle. In this case, it emits an alpha particle. And when that happens, this nucleus now contains two fewer protons and two fewer neutrons. So it's a different atom, a different element. <coughs> Beta decay occurs when an unstable nucleus emits an electron. So that's weird because there aren't any electrons in the nucleus. So we'll talk about exactly how that occurs. We'll look at um, uh, how protons and can be converted into neutrons, and neutrons can be converted into protons, and so on in the nucleus in different nuclear uh, processes. But for now, let's just take it for granted that, yes, beta decay occurs when an unstable nucleus emits an electron somehow. So remember that beta particles are 10 times more penetrating than alpha, which means that they won't interact with the first piece of matter that they come across in their when they're emitted. They can travel through Lots, they can travel through matter that's thicker than pieces of paper. Maybe they'll get stuck on something that's, I don't know, uh, uh, one-tenth of an inch. They might get stuck in something. Um, so beta particles are ten times more penetrating, but they only have about half the ionizing ability. And that kind of makes sense when you think about it. Ionizing means to turn a neutral particle into an ion. So an alpha particle having a two-plus charge could potentially uh, hit the nucleus of another atom, and that two plus charge could cause, could repel two protons, or could repel protons from the nucleus of another atom, thereby causing it to become an ion. So having a two plus charge makes it twice as able to ionize as an electron, which only has a minus one charge. So the, the 
magnitude of the charge has something to do with the ability of that particle to turn other particles into ions, which makes sense because a particle that in order to in order to eject electrons which are negative or protons which are positive from an atom the particle that's doing that must itself be negative or positive because a neutral particle will not interact with protons and neutrons because it's neutral so when an atom loses a beta particle its atomic number increases by one and the mass number remains the same so here's some of the weird stuff that I'm talking about that happens um, this particle is unstable radium 88 or excuse me radium 228 is unstable and when it decays it turns into an element that has more protons it loses something it loses an electron and somehow it gains a proton so how does that happen well what's really occurring here is that a neutron is turning into a proton so when a neutron turns into a proton the number of particles remains the same. There's still 228 particles in the nucleus. I didn't change the total number of particles, but now there's one fewer neutron and one extra proton. And in order for a neutron to turn into a proton, it has to emit uh, an electron. And the reason that that happens is because these numbers have to be conserved. So if uh, a, if I have 88 protons and then I have 89 protons, in order for 89 plus something to equal 88, in order for the numbers on this side to equal the numbers on this side, I have to put minus 1 over here. And the particle that has a negative 1 charge is an electron, which has a zero mass. So it still has 228 mass. It didn't lose any mass because it ejected an electron. So a neutron becomes a proton. Uh, the neutron here, let's, this is a carbon carbon 14 nucleus so that means that there's 14 particles six of them are protons and eight of them are neutrons 14 total the neutron becomes a proton and when the neutron becomes a proton I still have 14 particles because I didn't lose any of the nuclear particles but I gained an extra neutron or an extra proton so now I have seven neutrons and seven protons in nitrogen 14 so we can draw a nuclear reaction a, a nuclear equation that shows what's really happening when a neutron which is one mass and one or excuse me a zero charge so remember that um, one zero is a neutron one one is a proton and one oops and zero minus one is an electron so when a neutron becomes a proton then what's happened is the mass stays the same but the charge changes so how can something that's neutral turn into something that's positive well when you think about it it's because a thing that's neutral could we can really think about zero as also being the same as negative one plus one negative one plus one is zero two because when you put negative one and plus one together it equals zero so this is kind of the uh, uh, the definite this is kind of one way to think about antimatter which is that a neutron is really composed of a proton and an electron I know this is this is weird to think about because we haven't really we've, we've thought about these particles as being pretty constant but in fact they're not a proton has a positive one, an electron has a negative one. Plus one minus one equals zero. A proton has a mass of one, an electron has a mass of zero. So when I add a proton and an electron together, their total mass equals one. And when I add a proton and an electron together, their total charge equals zero. So a proton plus an electron actually equals a neutron. It's a really weird way to think about processes about nuclear processes and about these particles but that's actually what's happening so um, the neutron using some energy from the unstable nucleus a neutron is converted to a proton and that stabilizes the nucleus and when that happens an electron is also created during that process the proton and an electron and the electron is ejected from the nucleus 
going quickly and it has a lot of kinetic energy. So this is where the electron comes from inside the nucleus. We call that a beta particle. This is called beta decay. Gamma emission. So remember, alpha particles and beta particles are particles, a helium nucleus and an electron, respectively. Gamma rays are not particles. Gamma rays are just energy. They're electromagnetic radiation. So gamma rays are higher energy photons of light. So, okay, I guess I should say that they are particles. A photon is a particle, too. It's a particle without mass. So um, gamma alpha rays and beta rays are matter particles, and gamma rays are energy particles, uh, photons. So during gamma emission, there's no loss of, of particles from the nucleus. There, it doesn't lose any protons or any neutrons. It's just a array of energy. And here's how we uh, symbolize the energy. It has zero mass, it has zero charge, and it has a gamma symbol. And it's just pure energy, a gamma ray. It's just electromagnetic radiation. So even though ejecting a gamma ray by itself would not change the nucleus, Generally, gamma rays are not emitted by themselves. Uranium-238 will not only emit a gamma ray. Uranium-238 emits an alpha particle and a gamma ray. So gamma emission generally occurs after the nucleus undergoes some other type of decay, and the remaining particles rearrange, and there's extra energy that has to be let off. So uranium-238 has a lot of extra energy. It loses some of the energy in the form of an alpha particle, and it loses some of the energy in the form of a gamma ray, and then this energy plus this energy plus this energy is equal to the energy of an unstable uranium atom. So um, gamma emission generally does not occur by itself. It usually accompanies alpha emission or it accompanies beta emission. It's not just gamma emission by itself. Um, gamma, remember, gamma is the most penetrating, which means that gamma particles can go through even, you know, four, five, six inches of lead. So you have to have, you know, a foot thick lead in order to stop gamma particles. They can get through a lot. However, they're the least ionizing. And again, remember, because in order to be, to ionize um, a neutral particle, it has to interact with protons or neutrons, which are charged. And being that it does not have a charge, it's less likely to interact with protons and neutrons. So it goes right through matter but it's, it's the least ionizing. It's the least likely to actually do something bad to the matter while it's going through it. It just passes right through. Um, positron emission. OK, so finally we get to this anti-electron. So this is another weird concept. You know, we, we're getting into some weird stuff here in this uh, in this chapter about radioactivity that we don't really touch on and in fact that we kind of take for granted that is not true when we're thinking about the rest of chemistry. So um, when we think about chemistry we talk about particles, electrons, protons, and neutrons as being subatomic particles, the smallest bits of matter, right, and that they're immutable and that a proton is a proton and it doesn't change and during chemical reactions the protons and neutrons aren't being rearranged and they're not changing into other things. But that's not actually true. In some elements, protons do turn into neutrons. And elements can turn into other elements if they're unstable and radioactive. And another weird thing is that there's a thing called antimatter, which is that for every particle, there is an antiparticle, which is the opposite of that particle in some ways. And when a particle and its antiparticle collide and interact with each other, they annihilate each other, which means they turn into energy. So. We have said that the amount of energy in the universe is constant and you can't create or destroy energy and that the matter is constant and you can't create or destroy matter. But that's, it is, it is true, but what that doesn't say is that energy itself can be converted into matter and matter itself can be converted into pure energy. So in some ways you can destroy matter, but you're not destroying it but you're turning it into energy and vice versa. So if I have a particle and its antiparticle, so an electron and a positron, those are pieces of matter. They have a small mass, but they have a mass. A positron has a mass too. So an electron has mass, a positron has mass. When they hit each other and they annihilate, they turn into electromagnetic radiation, which has no mass. Where did their mass go? 
their mass turned into energy. So antimatter can annihilate matter when antiparticles collide with their regular particle and regular matter counterparts. So luckily for us, there's not a lot of antimatter in our galaxy. So there's not a lot of these annihilation reactions occurring. But sometimes, just like two particles can hit each other and turn into pure energy, sometimes energy can create particles. And sometimes just in, in the vacuum of space, an electron and a positron will be created out of energy. And then they will hit each other and they will annihilate and convert back into energy. So particles can kind of come from nowhere, seemingly. The energy can spontaneously convert itself into a particle and its antiparticle. And that's their equal, because a particle plus its antiparticle are really equal to zero, because when they hit, they can annihilate. So a positron is a piece of antimatter. It has a charge of plus one and a negligible mass, the same mass as an electron. Similar to beta particle in its ionizing and penetrating ability, because it has the same mass and the same magnitude of charge, even though its charge is the opposite. And when an atom loses a positron from its nucleus, you might say, well, how does that happen? There aren't any positrons in the nucleus. Well, it's another one of these weird uh, nuclear processes where a neutron can turn into a proton. But guess what? A proton can also turn into a neutron. So for when a proton turns into a neutron, then we can write a nuclear equation that shows a proton turning into a neutron requires something that has zero mass, right? Because one plus something equals one, and zero plus something equals one. So this thing also must have a plus one charge. So in order for a proton to turn into a neutron, I also have to emit a particle that has no mass and a plus one charge. Well, that's the positron. So neutrons can turn into protons, and then they emit beta particles. But protons can turn into neutrons, and then they emit positrons, an anti-electron. So this is a very similar process to beta emission. Positron emission and beta emission are very similar. A proton turning to a neutron, a neutron turning to a proton. That's why uh, this can sometimes be called beta plus and uh, beta emission can be called beta minus because they're very, very similar processes. They're just kind of like the opposite of each other. So here's an example of a, an element that's undergoing positron emission. If I um, am trying to figure out what kind of radioactive decay this element is undergoing, and I have half of the reaction, and it says phosphorus 30 goes to silicon 30, and I would say, OK, so this kind of radioactive decay is a decay which is releasing a particle that doesn't have mass. So it can't be an alpha decay. Alpha particles have mass. This could be beta decay, and this could be positron emission, because uh, those emit particles that have zero mass. But when I see that it goes from 15 to 14, then I know that this has to be a plus 1. And if this is a plus 1, then that makes this a positron. If it went from 15 to 16, then I would know this has to be minus 1, and that would make it 0 and minus 1, which would mean it was beta emission. So finally, there's another kind of uh, nuclear process called electron capture. And electron capture is really um, the opposite. It's, it's the reverse reaction of beta emission. So if I have an electron, electron, and that interacts with a proton, an electron plus a proton. What's that going to make? Negative 1 and positive 1 makes 0. 0 plus 1 makes 1. And what particle has 1 mass and 0 charge? A neutron. So a proton can turn into a neutron in two ways. Let's go back for a second. A proton can turn into a neutron if it emits uh, a positron. Proton turns into a neutron, emits a positron. Or we see here, 
a proton can turn into a neutron if it captures an electron. So hold on, I'm going to write these two equations in a different spot. So um, a proton plus an electron makes a neutron. This is electron capture. And beta decay is just this reaction in reverse, where a neutron becomes a proton and releases. To differentiate them, this time let's write beta, show that this is a beta decay. So we can see they're really just the opposite. If a proton captures an electron, it turns into a neutron. If a neutron becomes a proton, it has to emit an electron or a beta particle. So these electron capture and uh, beta decay are the reverse of each other. Right? They, they both involve a neutron becoming a proton or a, a proton becoming a neutron. So um, no, in electron capture, there's no particle emission. Um, but it would likely emit some kind of ray, maybe a, a gamma ray is, is likely accompanying, or an X-ray or something. And when electron capture occurs, um, we can see that, again, we've changed the number of protons. 44 plus an electron is going to make 43. 92 plus zero mass makes 92. So I've turned ruthenium into technetium. Um, so you might be saying, well, where does this electron come from? Uh, an electron is being captured by the nucleus. Well, generally, it is an electron that's in the or it's orbiting the nucleus. So if I have an unstable atom that is radioactive nuclide, and there are electrons that are in the inner orbitals right next to the nucleus, sometimes one of those electrons that's orbiting the nucleus can actually get pulled inside the nucleus and get converted uh, turn a proton into a neutron. So finally, here's a chart that summarizes all of the different models, uh, modes of radioactive decay, and um, example uh, equations, nuclear equations for each of these processes. So alpha emitting a piece of matter, an alpha particle. Beta emitting a piece of matter, uh, an electron, a beta particle. Gamma emitting only energy, electromagnetic energy, a gamma particle, a gamma photon. Positron emission emits um, matter, it emits a positron, which is an anti-electron. And electron capture is the only one where it's a nucleide, an uh, unstable nucleide reacting with something. In all of these, they are all spontaneously emitting something. But here I have something that's absorbing an electron in order to change the nucleus, to, turn, to make the nucleus become more stable. So become familiar with these particles, their, uh, their representations, alpha, beta, gamma, positron, electron for electron capture. And look at the different examples and realize that if I only have one of the products, I can figure out what the other one is. If I said uranium was decaying by alpha decay and I had this, this part, this half of the equation, it would be easy to write this half. I know that 4 plus something equals 238. Well, that must be 234. I know that 2 plus something equals 92. It must be 90. So it's easy to write the other half of the equation if I'm only given half of it. It's easy to figure out if I see two nuclei, a, a parent nuclide and a daughter nuclide, it's easy to figure out what was the mode of radioactive decay because I can write this particle and I say, oh, that's a beta particle, this was beta decay.